Um, thank you everyone for being here this evening. Uh, for those that may not know who I am, um, I'm Steve Wernick, Rabbi Wernick, one of the rabbis of Beth Sedek Congregation. And it's our pleasure to welcome back our old friend, our dear friend, uh, Professor Stephen Perk, Burke, um, uh, for what will be the, the third of, uh, of his three lecture series with us uh, this year. We hope, God willing, next year, poo, poo, poo. Uh, not only the Shana Haba, but Yerushalayim shall uh, Malta, meaning Florida, um, but also <laughs> uh, uh, next year we should be able to gather, God willing, um, together um, and re restart uh, our scholar in residence weekends with Professor Burke. Um, when we chose this topic, um, my people, your people, uh, a look at um, the relationship of, uh, of Jews and Blacks, uh, specifically in the US, but also in Canada and really around the world, um, we were thinking about the uh, events that transpired last summer uh, and the need to uh, remind ourselves of the importance of uh, race relations between, um, between our people and, uh, and really as Jews, um, our understanding of uh, the damage that is inevitably caused as a result of, uh, of racial injustice. I um, mean, as a congregation, we committed ourselves to really um, do better, uh, both in terms of our own culture and how we welcome uh, the diversity of the Jewish people uh, into our own community, but also as a leading congregation within the GTA, Canada, and around the world, um, how can we set an example uh, for, um, uh, for the values uh, of caring and connecting and give and get that are so important to us? Uh, and so that's why we chose this topic. Um, truthfully, we wanted to do something around Passover. We thought liberation, freedom, slavery, uh, the metaphor of the Exodus, which Martin Luther King Jr. used, was one of the reasons why Jews so easily were able to support the civil rights movement in the US because it was a familiar theme uh, based on Passover. What we didn't realize um, was that the week in which we would be um, having this lecture and also the night itself when we, when we scheduled it, we didn't realize that this was the evening of Yom HaShoah, era of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Commemoration Day. Um, what a fitting lecture on such an important day in which uh, we remember uh, what happened to the Jewish people as a result of hatred and as a result of uh, both societal, um, civil, uh, legal, and cultural uh, discrimination uh, and hate. Um, we know where that leads uh, because we've been there. Uh, and so I just want to take note that this evening is Yom HaShoah, uh, the era of Yom HaShoah, in which we begin Holocaust Commemoration Day. We remember those lives lost in the Holocaust and part of never forgetting is to ensure that we uh, remember uh, to always be advocates and engaged in uh, human rights and in civil rights uh, everywhere uh, in our backyard and around the world. Uh, the second thing that is ironic is that the trial of George Floyd, um, of the officer that uh, killed George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis is taking place um, at this very moment. And um, uh, the testimony uh, and uh, the judicial system is uh, taking place as we're having this conversation. We could not have uh, anticipated the convergence of the George Floyd uh, murder trial of Yom HaShoah um, with this evening. Um, all of that is to say that the topic uh, remains uh, critically important for our um, understanding of our own history and our commitment uh, to uh, racial justice, even just justice, to justice anywhere it, it is experienced uh, in the world. Um, we believe, as I spoke about at Kol Nidre, uh, when we introduced um, this particular theme this year, um, that we're all creating the image and likeness of God, uh, to which the Midrash asks, 
Um, why is it that God created humanity from a single Adam, from a single being, so that no one can say that my ancestor is greater than your ancestor? Uh, meaning, uh, we all come from the same common ancestor, uh, which is Adam, the first human being created in the image and likeness of God. And what God, what makes God unique as the Midrash continues is that whereas human beings, when we mint a coin, for example, we mint them all the exact same way from a mold um, that is copied. But when God mints human beings, we come from um, a, a single mold, that Adam, that first human being, uh, but we are all molded or formed, fashioned uh, with the great diversity that we understand humanity to be. Um, and so we're really um, uh, I'm pleased that you are here with us this evening. We're pleased to welcome back uh, Professor Burke uh, and we're pleased to continue um, to be a leading voice uh, on this topic of, uh, of justice. And with that, um, I'm going to um, introduce Michael uh, who will uh, formally welcome us on behalf of his family uh, and the uh, foundation uh, that are so generously sponsored this uh, program with Professor Burke every year. We thank you, Michael, and we thank you and your entire family for your continued generosity and leadership. And Michael will, at the conclusion of his um, remarks, uh, formally introduce Professor Burke, and then we'll begin. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat and I'll um, pass them on to the professor during the program. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Sam and Sarah Kirsner and Joseph Kirsner Memorial Community Lectures hosted by Beth Setter Congregation and sponsored in association with the UJA Foundation of Toronto. I am Michael Kirsner and together with my wife, Rochelle, my parents, Max and Dolly, and my uncle Lou, we are delighted that you have joined us this evening, virtually, wherever you are, to hear our outstanding scholar in residence, Professor Stephen Burke. Tonight, over one year into this unprecedented pandemic, I wanted to say a few words about how my late grandparents and uncle would have used their steadfastness and resolve to show us the way from darkness into light. It is true, unfortunately, that we find ourselves in a dark time. But we know that stars only shine in the darkness. And we have bright stars amongst us, our frontline healthcare workers, our clergy, and I might add, our leaders of government, to name a few. The things to remember is that no matter how challenging or difficult a moment might be, it's about how you hold it, how you see it, how you move with it and in it that will determine our path forward. What COVID has taught us is that we need to shine a little brighter. This pandemic reminded us how we look differently into darkness and how we need to be a light against injustice, poverty and intolerance now more than ever. It is about striking a balance between tradition and change. What my grandparents and uncle taught us is a reaffirmation in the belief that each and every person carries the spark of the divine within them. And it is incumbent upon all of us to lead with the light of God, which we all share. We read a great quote from our proverb that the soul of a person is the candle of God, meaning that we can share that light from one candle to the next without diminishing our own light. Our values are not what we consume, but what we can contribute. We are here in a shared sacred moment in our Judaic Christian Passover Easter calendar season. As we know, Passover is a story of darkness into light, of liberation to freedom. Easter is also a story about darkness into light. These sparks of light from within help us undeniably to mend isolation and despair. And that's what community building is all about. Faiths can also build bridges and help us appreciate there is unity in diversity. 
Sam and Sarah Kersner and Joseph Kersner would have looked at this time and said, Hineni, we are here. May their memories always be for a blessing. Friends, we're delighted again to welcome back our scholar, our teacher, and our friend Stephen Burke, who after 30 years really needs no introduction. Stephen is here to complete the 2020-2021 speaking series, and he will speak tonight perhaps on a not well-known story that I'm sure will fascinate the curious. He will speak that the leaders of the civil rights movement of Dr. Martin Luther King and John Lewis and others who joined arm in arm were from many faiths. The civil rights movement proved that in our ordinariness, we all have an ability to achieve something extraordinary. And the roads and bridges they crossed helped us begin a path of justice and friendship and tolerance. Stephen, you have taught us that history is shaped by unremarkable people who have given the opportunity, made, and may make remarkable choices. With the light of your teachings, we warmly welcome you back, Stephen, and look forward very much to your lecture tonight. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Rabbi Wernick, and thank Beth Sedek. I consider it a synagogue, my home away from home. I'm about to speak to you of concerning one of the glorious moments in the history of the American Jewish community. That is the Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement, beginning, let us say, in the second half of the 19th century, and really in some ways continuing right down to the present day. It's a good chapter, but please do not misconstrue what I am saying. Victory in the civil rights movement, and I'm defining victory, by the civil rights legislation passed by the American Congress in 1964 and 1965. Only an idiot would deny the existence of racism and anti-black sentiment in the United States at the present time. But a turning point was established in the middle of the 1960s. And the Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement is something to be very, very proud of. Let me begin at the beginning. Jews marched with John Brown. Jews marched in the abolitionist movement during the period before the Civil War and in the Civil War itself. But the abolitionists really presented a problem for the Jews. First of all, they were violent. And secondly, some of the abolitionists were really proselytizing Christians. Jews were uncomfortable with that. And the result was that Jews gave support to the civil rights movement really in the pre-Civil War period. They opposed slavery, most of them, outside of the South. And by the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century, the Jews lined up. Again, you can't make a statement all Jews did. That's not, that's not clear. But there were many Jews that did. So let me give you an example. One of the founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the premier African-American organization in the United States. The first president of that organization was a man of German Jewish extraction, Elias Spingarn. He was a professor of English at Columbia, resigned from Columbia and devoted his life to the NAACP. His brother, Arthur Spingarn, a very prominent attorney, became the head of the legal bureau of the NAACP. And right through the 1940s up until his death, he really was really the most articulate legal spokesman for the organization. And he presided over some winning, let us say, winning court cases. During the First World War, the position of African-Americans deteriorated precipitously. In the immediate aftermath of the war, there was a massive pogrom in certain cities. There were pogroms in certain cities. Black soldiers in uniform were immolated. They were literally burnt alive. Jews responded to that. The most prominent members of the Jewish community were terribly upset by what was happening. After all, whether they came from Germanic Europe or they came from the Russian Empire, they all knew about anti-Semitism. They all knew about the discrimination, the suffering that Jews had experienced at the hands of the anti-Semites in Europe. There was a, there was a feeling of, of comradeship, a kindred spirit. We must do something for our African-American brothers and sisters. 
So let me give you the names of some of these people. These were the people of the Jewish plutocracy. Jacob Schiff, Louis Marshall, for example. And perhaps in terms of the, the relationship or the impact on the African-American community was the president of Sears Roebuck, Julius Rosenwald. Rosenwald gave tens of millions of dollars to educate black students in the South. At one point in time, 40%, 40% of all black students in the South were educated in Rosenwald schools. Rosenwald also provided scholarships for a number of very, very gifted black students to go on to higher education, receive PhDs in Northern universities. Perhaps the most famous of them was Ralph Bunch, probably the first man to win the Nobel Prize for trying to bring peace in the Middle East. So the Jewish plutocracy rallied behind the civil rights movement. So the Spingarns, the Schiffs, the Warburgs, the Lehmans, all those, all those uptown Jews, those German Jews. But again, it was not only them. There were other people involved. Jewish unions, Jewish unions, for example, like the ILGWU, the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, the Fourier workers. These were largely Jewish unions and they were the first unions in the United States to accept black and Latino workers. And if you wanted to know something about the civil rights movement, if you wanted to know something about the sufferings of African-Americans in this country, do you know what newspaper you would read? Not the New York Times, not the New York Herald Tribune. You would read the Forbes. You would read the leading Yiddish newspaper. It was the Yiddish newspapers that covered better than any other American newspaper, except for the black press, of course, more than any other Anglo press newspaper. It was the Yiddish press that highlighted the sufferings and the struggles of blacks in the South and elsewhere to attain civil rights. And in fact, there was a, a Jewish reporter, Louis Isaac Jaffe, very few people know about him. He was the editor of the Virginia Pilot, a Southern newspaper. And in 1929, Jaffe won the Pulitzer Prize for journalism because he had the guts to talk about and write about the lynching of a black man and criticize the Ku Klux Klan. So Jewish involvement, again, from top to bottom, the plutocracy or the oligarchy, whatever word you want to use, again, the Schiffs, the Warburgs, the Lehmans, all of the Rosenwalds, then the union people, and then those middle-class Jewish organizations from the conservative movement, the reform movement, the orthodox community, the B'nai B'rith, the Anti-Defamation League, all of these people threw their weight in behalf of the civil rights movement. And then, of course, the turning point. The turning point not only for African Americans, but certainly for the Jewish community as well. And that is World War II. World War II changed many things in the United States, many, many things. One million black soldiers fought for the arm in the war in the armed forces of the United States, fighting to make the world a better place. And they saw, they saw the irony. Black soldiers in uniform could not go to the same places. Let me put it another way. It was good to be a prisoner of the United States. The United States took thousands of German prisoners of war and put them in prison camps in the South, in Mississippi and Louisiana. For R&R, &R, for rest and recreation, on a Saturday night, some of these German POWs were taken to theaters in the South. The very same theaters that would not allow a black soldier in American military uniform to enter. I must tell you, when one looks back on this, it is, to use the old language, it is a Michigas. It's a Balagan. It's hard to believe that there were American colleges that would not play against a football team that had a black player on it. Un absolutely unbelievable when you look back at it. So the turning point is going to come for the civil rights movement in two ways. The most important way is that many of those black American soldiers, having served with distinction in combat, now come back to the United States, come back to the American South, and find themselves, they can't, they can't get, as we would say in the United States, they can't get to first base. It is a difficult thing. And if one looks at the history of the civil rights movement, and one looks at the grassroots support 
for Reverend Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders. It comes in very many cases from black veterans of World War II. And for Jews too, it is a turning point. Again, this is not really a lecture, a general lecture on Jewish history, modern American Jewish history, but the, the World War II changes things too. After the Second World War, who can deny anymore that there's a need for a Jewish state? The American Jewish community really was not very supportive of Zionism. It is the eternal glory of the conservative movement and of the Hadassah Medical Organization that these were the only two organizations that consistently supported Zionism. But after World War II, it changes. And then, of course, as far as serving in the, uh, serving in the, uh, in the, in the war, 500,000 Jewish Americans had served in the war. They have now more self-confidence. And for American society at large, and this is important, including particularly in relation to the civil rights movement, many of the old discriminatory legislations, many of the old discriminatory practices get thrown into as what Trotsky would call the garbage band of history. How can you speak about kikes and makis and heaps after the Second World War? You're spitting on the graves of our soldiers who fought against the Nazis. This will give the Jews increasing confidence and will allow them, in addition to the affinity that they feel for blacks because of the suffering of blacks, it leads them to, in fact, give support, political support, grassroots support, and financial support. Let me give you an example. In the United States, the turning point in legislation is the famous Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. A black man by the name of Mr. Brown wants his daughter to go to a school. The school is segregated, blah, blah, blah. And it goes before the whole issue of segregation in the schools goes before the Supreme Court. But there's another Brown in Brown versus the Board of Education. That's a middle class Jewish housewife from Kansas City, Missouri. Esther Brown. It's Esther Brown who knows Mr. Brown and tells him you don't have to take this stuff anymore. I will get you support, and we will bring this to the Supreme Court. So Esther Brown is important here. And then also in that Supreme Court decision, it was understood that for the Supreme Court ruling, if it was to have an impact upon the American consciousness, it was to have to be a 9-0, a unanimous verdict by the Supreme Court. More than any other man on the Supreme Court, the man who made sure, who did everything in his power to guarantee that it was 9-0 was the Jewish member of the Supreme Court, Felix Frankfurter, one of the best legal minds in the history of the, of the American Supreme Court. So there's a Jewish role there. And then as the years go by, slowly but inexorably, pressure begins to build up, move to move beyond desegregating the schools. That is, National transport, that is cross, cross, crossing state lines. So we have really in 1960-61, we have the Freedom Riders. 40% of the white Freedom Riders were men and women who were Jewish. Absolutely incredible. And then, of course, things pick up steam and a number of civil rights organizations are created. One of them, some of you are familiar with this, was the organization known as SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. The first president of SNCC, the first president of SNCC was a black Jew, a Jew who had converted, a black man who had converted to Judaism. That was Charles McDew. And then when stuff really hits the fan, in the Mississippi summer of 1964, 1,000 young men and women from the North, black and white, are now going to go south to Mississippi. They're going to register blacks to vote. They're going to create what were called freedom schools. And they created a new political party, the Mississippi, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Blacks were not allowed to vote. They were not able to participate in the regular Democratic Party in Mississippi. So a new party is created. And of the 1,000 people who go down, of the whites who go down, again, we're talking about somewhere between 30 and 40%. These are young men and women. Some of them are coming from the most elite schools in the United States, and they are coming for a variety of reasons. It's always hard to ascertain motivation. 
very, very hard. Some of them come because remember, 1964 is less than 20 years after the end of the Second World War. The Holocaust is alive and well in the minds of large numbers of Americans, both young and old. And some of these young men and women really, again, are native born Americans, have no direct experience with the Holocaust, but they know about the Holocaust and they will not stand for any type of racial discrimination. Others are motivated by left-wing ideals. It is interesting that some of the people, men and women, who participated, Jewish men and women, were really people that were referred to uh, in, in a phenomenon known as the red diaper thesis. Left-wing parents very often have left-wing children. And so a number of these young men and women were the sons and daughters and grandchildren of people who had been members of the American Communist Party, the Social Democratic Movement, and the left wing of the Democratic Party. These are the people, together with people who have an experience whose parents were involved in trade unions, and generally people who, again, believe that America was not fulfilling its obligations. So there's a mixture of motivations on the part of these young people. And when the terror strikes, as everybody certainly who knows, the, has even the most cursory knowledge of the civil rights movement knows, terror strikes in the form of three young men who are murdered in Mississippi in the Mississippi summer of 1964. Two of the three, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, they were Jews. The other man, a young black man by the name of James Cherney, Cheney. So the Jews are putting their blood on the line here. And in addition to that, it seems like a million years ago, but it really wasn't. Doctors went down, lawyers went down from the North, from California, from all over, from areas in the United States beyond the South. 50% of the doctors who went down to help the civil rights people were Jewish. 50 to 60% of the attorneys who went South in the Mississippi summer, again, were Jewish. So the Jewish role here is quite substantial. And then we come to not a controversial area. In some ways it's controversial, but at the time it was very controversial. That is the role of rabbis in the civil rights movement. Now, I know I'm talking to people in Beth Zedek, a conservative synagogue. I have spent my entire life in the conservative movement. I belong to a conservative synagogue in Schenectady. I'm a proud member of a conservative synagogue, but I must tell you, while there was, and we'll come to that in a moment, a good deal of conservative rabbinical support for the civil rights movement, this is the golden hour of Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism with its emphasis on, on the, pro, the prophetic ideas, with its emphasis upon what is called social action, more than any other group within the American Jewish community, Reform Judaism really played a role. The leader of the social action community, community within Reform Judaism was not a rabbi. This was a good and decent man, Al Vorspan, V-O-R-S-P-A-N. I mentioned some proper nouns to you, some names to you. You should remember these names. These are people who put their lives on the line. Rabbi Lelyveld, for example, from Cleveland, Cleveland. And the most courageous of them all were some Southern rabbis, Reform rabbis. We'll talk about rabbis in the South in general. It's not, a, it's not a golden time for rabbis in the South, but one can understand that. But three men stood out. Jacob Rothschild in Atlanta, Aryeh Becca in Memphis, and also, of course, probably the most courageous of them all, because he was in the, den, the lion's den, was Charles Montenban in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Now, let me say to you, I've spent a good deal of time researching Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement. And I must tell you, I am a specialist in Soviet and Russian history. I am also very much involved in teaching the Holocaust. When you read about, when you study life in the American South, in Mississippi, in the hardcore South, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, Alabama, it's as if you are immersing yourself in a foreign country. Keep in mind, between 1880 and 1940, 3,500 black men were lynched. 
That's what we know of. There were people that we didn't, that, that never that just disappeared. It doesn't count the black men that were castrated, the black women and girls that were raped. That we don't know. We can't count out those numbers. And that these rabbis had the guts to speak out in behalf of civil rights is a tribute to them. It really is. Southern rabbis, in fairness, had a problem. Most Southern rabbis looked around them and confronted two, two, facts, re, two facts of reality. One was there were Southern Jews in their congregation. I wouldn't say a majority of them, but certainly not, not a small minority who were staunch segregationists. There were Jews that joined the white citizens councils. And in addition to that, as rabbis looked around, what did they see? They saw a number of Christian, number of churches set on fire, being blown up because their priests and their ministers spoke out on behalf of the blacks. And for rabbis, who could forget the burning, the, the arson, the bombing of the temple, the famous, the most prestigious synagogue in Atlanta, Rothschild Synagogue. Violence stalked the South. And I'll give you an example. There was a rabbi in Alexandria, Virginia. Alexandria, Virginia, in the 50s and 60s, not the Alexandria, Virginia now. Now it's swarming with federal workers. And now when you watch election night, that part of Virginia has now really turned the tide. Virginia is now very close to being a blue state. But Alexandria, Virginia, in the 50s and 60s, very difficult. Difficult for Jews, and certainly more difficult even for Blacks. So in Alexandria, Virginia, there was a reform rabbi, Emmett Frank. Emmett Frank spoke out on behalf of Black people and on behalf of the civil rights movement. He receives a call one day. He's gotten many obscene phone calls, but this one struck home where the caller said, if you don't stop speaking out about Blacks in the civil rights movement, I'm going to come into your house and I'm going to cut out the eyes of your children. Frank, almost immediately, went to a nearby television station with a shotgun and said, if anybody comes near my kids, I'll blow your heads off. Frank would spend some time in a mental institution. The pressure was very, very great on these Southern, these Southern rabbis. And it led to tension between them and Northern rabbis who were going coming South. It is, I told you, many reform rabbis and many conservative rabbis. I'm in the process of writing a book. I don't know when it will be finished, but the title of the book is Our People Are Your People. That's a statement by a conservative rabbi in Birmingham, Alabama, in the spring of 1963. He is speaking in a Baptist church, a black Baptist church. Outside of the church are white rednecks. They're throwing things at the church. They're screaming obscenities. And this rabbi has got the chutzpah to get up on the altar or the platform and say he makes that statement, addressing the blacks in the church. Our people are your people. We Jews are standing with you. And so these northern rabbis come down. A lot of conservative rabbis come down. The most famous of them, of course, is Abraham Joshua Heschel. I must tell you parenthetically, I like that film Selma. But there were two sins in that film. I don't know how many of you saw it. That, that's, that's the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. There were three marches from Selma to the bridge. You know what the two mistakes were? One concerns us, the Jewish community, and the other concerns really real history. In the sense, Lyndon Johnson is made out in the film to be a reluctant supporter of the civil rights movement. That's a crock. Johnson put his prestige on the line. You can say many things about Lyndon Johnson, but Lyndon Johnson was a strong supporter of the civil rights movement, and it was Lyndon Johnson that twisted the arms of Southern, some Southern senators to get the two bills passed in 1964 and 1965. That's a sin of commission in the film. The sin of omission in the film, there's no picture of Abraham Joshua Heschel in the film. Heschel marched almost arm in arm. The real picture, the real photograph, shows Martin Luther King, and to his left is Ralph Bunch, that I spoke to you about before, 
And to the left of Bunch, arm in arm, is Abraham Joshua Heschel. There were Greek Orthodox priests, there were Roman Catholic priests, there were Protestant ministers. They all are visible in that film, but not Abraham Joshua Heschel and not the other rabbis that were there. There was a rabbi carrying a Torah, Rabbi Israel Dresner. He's not in the film either. That's a serious mistake. But the point here is Northern rabbis, rabbis from all out of the South, are coming down. Now, in fairness, it has to be said that their congregations were supportive. Rabbis who came from the North or from outside of the South didn't have to worry that their contracts would be terminated because they were, in fact, marching in behalf of civil, the civil rights movement. But in the other hand, on the other hand, Southern rabbis faced that. Now, as far as the Jewish attitude, the general Jewish attitude was to Martin Luther King Jr., it was a very, very sympathetic one. A very, very, benevolence is not the right word. A very, very sympathetic and a very friendly one. And that was because of Reverend King himself. Number one, remember Reverend King fashioned himself. His great hero is Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi of civil disobedience and nonviolence. King never practiced violence. In fact, King had trouble with some of the other civil rights organizations who wanted to have a more militant position and were in fact moving in the direction of violence. King would not have it. And many Jews who were politically conscious and concerned themselves with the civil rights movement, really in their gut and in their head, they understood an axiom of politics, both in the United States and in the old country as well. Violence always or nearly always eventually evolves into an attack upon the Jews. Violence is not a good thing as far as Jews are concerned in a revolutionary movement. It happened in Russia, it happened in Poland, it happened in Romania, it happened in other places. Movements that do not start out as being anti-Semitic, when they strike at the existing authorities, anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. The other thing was, Reverend King was always sympathetic to Jewish concerns. He supported, remember, again, it seems like a million years ago. Do you remember when we used to twin our kids and grandkids in the synagogues with Soviet Jewish boys and girls? When so the issue of Soviet Jewry was on our lips and on, in our minds in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s? One of the great supporters of the Soviet Jewry movement in the United States was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And in addition, nobody... There were very few people in the United States that were more supportive of the state of Israel than Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He came out supporting Israel when a number of other black leaders, we'll talk about that, were opposed, supported the Palestinian side, supported the Arab side during the Six Day War. Not Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He, in fact, came out and said that hostility to Israel is a form of anti Semitism. So, what does it mean Jews rally to him? The most important Jew that rallies to him is going to be uh, a man that at one point in time we think had been a member of the American Communist Party. This man, again a very important man, considered Martin Luther King his closest friend. And what's going to happen is, with the passage of time, King will consider to him, consider him to be his most reliable white friend, and according to David Garrow, probably the best biographer of Martin Luther King, this white man is going to be considered to be the, uh, the one of his most reliable supporters. This man will write Martin Luther, help write Martin Luther King's speeches, file his tax returns. This man has a home on Martha's Vineyard, he will invite Martin Luther King there. He will negotiate Martin Luther King's book contracts. This is remarkable. And again, if I was speaking to an American audience, I don't know if they do it in Canada. In the United States, comes election time, you get telephone calls, you get mailings asking for contributions and so on. That's because of the Jewish role in this, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That's important. There was Marvin Rich, another man, a man married to a black woman and the representative of Histadrut, the Israeli labor unions. 
He was the representative in New York City. He becomes a fundraiser for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And if you look at the, the, the studies, the analyses of CORE, CORE had a special list, the specials and the extra special specials. That is in terms of those who contributed to CORE. And you can bet your last buck, you shouldn't be surprised. The great majority of the people who contributed to CORE in the highest levels were Jews. Jews played a role in CORE. Jews played, played a role in SNCC. Jews played a role in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And Jewish intellectuals played their role. The three Irvings, Irving Lewis Horowitz, Irving Crystal, Irving Howe, professors, famous writers. They put articles in the popular press calling upon not only American Jews, but American Gentiles to rally to the cause of civil rights. And the best book, that's not correct. The best-selling book on civil rights in the year 1964 was written by a Jew, Charles Silberman. The book is a famous book. It's still a good read, Crisis in Black and White, in which Silberman, which Silberman laid out what America was doing to its black population. And then in a classic example of the necessity of pushing the right button, remember this is 1964. This is the height of the Cold War. And Silberman told correctly, to the American people. We live in a world where people are of color. The majority of people in this world are people of color. How can we win the, com the competition with the Soviet Union in the Cold War when we persecute people of color in the United States? He castigated the black community too for not, having, not being able to speak out more, not having enough self-confidence. But above all, this Jewish writer leveled his accusations against white America, which you're doing is, is criminal. It's criminal, it's immoral, it's not pragmatic, it is detrimental to the best interest of the United States. And then there was Harry Golden. Now, Harry Golden was not the top of the line in terms of, of intellectual endeavor. He was the editor, the owner, the publisher, the editor of the Carolina Israelite. Now, the Carolina Israelite was a Jewish newspaper that circulated through the South. It probably was read by more Gentiles than it was by Jews. He was a cantankerous old guy and all fossil. That's what he was. But he said something here. Had, he really attacked in a gentle way, in a comical way, segregation in the South. He also said something. It really has nothing to do with the civil rights movement, but it's a good remark. Harry Golden's father went to the synagogue every Shabbos. When does every Shabbos he went to the synagogue? And Harry said to him, Pop, I know you don't believe in God. Why do you go to the synagogue every Shabbos? Why are you there in Rosh Hashanah? And why are you there in Yom Kippur? And Harry Golden's father said, Harry, you know my friend, Mr. Goldberg? Harry said, yeah. Mr. Goldberg goes to the synagogue to talk to God. I go to the synagogue to talk to Mr. Goldberg. Harry Golden was a really a good guy, a commercial, but a good guy. And again, in his own way, he changed the hearts and minds of moderate Southerners. It is not true that all Southerners were pro vicious and zealous proponents of segregation. It was not true. There were moderates there, and he turned the hearts and minds of moderates. So there was a Jewish role there in terms of intellectual life. And then again, we come back. Clausewitz had said in the 18th century, Napoleon had said the same thing in the 19th century. I'm putting a tweak on it. Both men had said money is the artery of war. They were right. You cannot win wars without substantial financial contributions. But money was the artery of the civil rights movement. Money was used, again, to print material. Money was used to defend civil rights leaders like, like Martin Luther King Jr. in the, in the famous Sullivan case, the free speech case. And money was also important in providing bail for many, many whites who were imprisoned in Mississippi and elsewhere. And in fact, it's a reform rabbi in Jackson, Mississippi, Perry Nussbaum, who goes out to the Parchman prison and he's the mediator. He's the man that brings the letters from, Jewish, from Jews who were imprisoned in Parchman 
to their parents and brings letters from their parents to them. And in the north, there were the bagel babies, the young men and women, Jewish men and women, who pressed, protested outside of Woolworths, who protested outside of all of those stores that wouldn't hire blacks and wouldn't serve black people. It is a glorious record. It really is. It's something to be proud about. Very much so. And yet, and yet, at the high tide of this Jewish black cooperation, things are going to go sour. They're going to go sour again for a number of reasons. One, and this applies to Jews as well as blacks, and Jews and other whites, it is, I told you in the beginning, when we talked about the Mississippi summer, many of these white students, they came from the elite schools, they were very smart. They knew how to write. They knew how to speak. They began to take over the civil rights movement. In the eyes of blacks in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, whites were taking over what is a movement that should have belonged to the black people. It's not true that the whites were taking it over, but perception is reality. The Jew, Jews and other whites were playing a very important role in the civil rights movement, and this angered some black people. And so there's going to be a turn. Against, the, against Jews and other whites. It's out of this struggle and out of this tension that comes the black power movement. When a number of people like Stacey, like Stokely Carmichael are going to argue, you know what? It's our movement, they're taking it over and let's get them the hell out of our movement. And between 1965 and 1968, there's close to a purge in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, for example, in SNCC and in other black organizations as well. And then we come to a very important development in American political history. Every American convention, democratic or Republican is important, but it's the 1964 democratic convention in Atlantic City that's extremely important. Blacks from Mississippi come to, they come to the convention and they want that their new party, the Mississippi Democratic Freedom Party, should be seated instead of the segregationist regular Democratic Party. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? They believe we had free elections. Don't let the regular Democratic Party sit. We struggle to register voters. We have a party. The Democratic leadership would not do it. Again, everything must be seen in its context. It's 1964. John Kennedy is dead. Lyndon Johnson is running for the presidency. Barry Goldwater threatens him. And he, what Barry Goldwater is making inroads into the Democratic South. In order to make sure that the South remains loyal in 1964, Blacks are not seated at the Democratic Convention. But a promise is made. The promise is that in 1968, at the next Democratic Convention, only, only if the Mississippi regular Democratic Party becomes fully integrated, will it be allowed to be seated. Now, this is important, important in Jewish history and important in American political history. What's going to happen is, number one, Blacks are infuriated that they are not seated at the convention. They're not seated. Out of that will come black power. That too generates black power. And in 1968, the Democratic Party adheres to its promise. It seats integrationist Democratic representatives from all over the South. And you know what happened? That's the great transformation in American politics. Black voters now enter the Democratic Party and vote Democratic. White voters march out of the Democratic Party and join the Republican Party. Again, for those of you who follow American political history or and are old enough, I remember when I was a kid, I would turn on American television on election night. The first votes that came in were from the South. And it was always, it was not an oxymoron. oxymoron. It was the Democratic South. The Democratic, the South always voted Democratic. That's a, a consequence of the Civil War, a consequence of, uh, of Reconstruction, and so on. But now, whites move out of the Democratic Party into the South. That changes the American political scene. So, black power 
is really going to put a nail in the coffin about the black Jewish relationship. Now, it's not over. It's not dead. But let me say to you, there are certain things along the way that made black Jewish cooperation very difficult to achieve. 1967, the Six Day War. I don't know what went on in Canada, but I know what happened in my own country. The fear in the United States among American Jews. Another Holocaust was going to descend upon Israel. The Jews were going to be wiped out. NASA was speaking about throwing the Jews into the sea, reversing the Nakba, the catastrophe, the great disgrace of Arabdom and of Islam, that the Jews had beaten them in 1948. This is the time we're going to turn the tide. We're going to throw them into the sea. We all know what happened in the war, the miraculous six-day victory. And then some members, like Stokely Carmichael, and like other people on the fringes of the African-American community, and not some, some of them were already in the mainstream, spoke out condemning Israel and supporting the Arab side. For many Jews, that was betrayal. With them, many of them said, look what we did for you in the civil rights movement. How can you turn against us? How can you turn against the only Jewish state? And then the violence, the attacks in Harlem, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Watson, California, Cleveland, Rochester. The riots were not aimed against Jews. They were aimed against white business owners. But in Harlem, things took a particular, a peculiar turn. Harlem used to be a Jewish enclave. One of the best books on American Jewish history is a book entitled by Jeffrey Gorak, When Harlem Was Jewish. The blacks come in in the 20s and the Jews leave. The Jews go to parts of Brooklyn, they go to the Bronx, they go to Westchester, they go to the Island of Long, they go to all these places. But Jewish businessmen and Jewish apartment house owners, they remain. The leading department store on 125th Street, 125th Street in Manhattan, that's the main thoroughfare of Harlem. The Main, the main department store was Jewish owned. That Jewish owned department store would not hire a black man or woman and would be contemptuous of those black, of black, of those black customers. So the attacks are going to come. They're not aimed exclusively against, against Jews, but since the Jews were disproportionately represented as shopkeepers, as pharmacists, as apartment store owners, as storekeepers, they're gonna suffer the brunt of this. And some of the rioters are going to say, make anti-Semitic remarks. Another turning point is going to come in the teacher strike in 1968. Now that's a very complicated issue. This is the whole the discussion is about community control. Now I must tell you, again, I was in Brooklyn. I was in high school in New York City, elementary school in New York City. Many of our teachers were Jewish. Many of the principals, assistant principals were Jewish. The guidance counselors were Jewish. But the demography, the demography of the student body was changing, Latino and black. And a number of black leaders say, we want community control. And the teachers union led by Albert Shanker, a Jew, opposed it. One could understand their position because they were beginning to fire teachers. The tension led to an eruption of anti-Semitism within some of the community control leaders and that too brought about a degeneration of the black Jewish coalition. Then again, we come to uh, 1979. The highest ranking black in the American diplomatic corps was Andy Young. Andy Young was the American ambassador to the United Nations. Andy, uh, Andy Young, we're not sure, did Jimmy Carter tell him to do it? We don't know. Did Andy Young do it on his own? We don't know. What we do know is that Andy Young conducted secret negotiations with Yasser Arafat and the PLO. At that time, the official American position was to have no relationship whatsoever with Arafat and the PLO. There was an uproar within the American Jewish community and within American society at large. Andy Young was forced out of his position a number of black people began to argue that Jews forced him out. No, I think 
The State Department probably forced him out because he was violating a long-standing American policy. That caused, again, tension between blacks and Jews. And then in 1982, one of the most prominent of all black leaders, Jesse Jackson, really a good and decent man, too far to the left for me, but a good and decent man. Jesse Jackson told a reporter, he was referring to New York City, and he called New York City Jaime Town, in effect, Jew Town. That became public, and the American Jewish community got terribly, the leaders got terribly upset. He apologized, but again, many people thought it was a half-hearted apology. Again, one of these things that separated, that caused rifts between blacks and Jews. And then an issue that really resonates right down to the present day, the issue of affirmative action. Affirmative action was designed to make open the way to minorities and to women. But very often it became a zero sum game. If you say that a hundred people, let us say in a class at a university, a hundred people receiving scholarships, should be blacks or people from the minority, then what does it do for the others? How many whites are closed out? When you give preference to blacks, women, and minorities in professional schools, somebody is going to be closed out. And here, history towers over us, over us like a mountain. For blacks, affirmative action was a way to leapfrogging over history, to somehow really make good, to be compensated for the terrible discrimination against blacks, and in the case of women, women as well. For Jews, however, affirmative action looked, at least to some Jews, as a quota system, a numerous clauses. That's what had bedeviled our people in Eastern Europe in the Russian Empire, limiting Jewish, into, limiting Jewish admissions into the gymnasiums, into the universities, into professional schools. It all depends on where you stand. History towered over us. So there was some opposition by Jews to affirmative action. That too caused a rift. So it's not like it was in the halcyon days of the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. The only time that really was a tension in that period of time, and it was resolved, more history than you ever wanted to know, was over the 1936 Olympic Games. Jews wanted the Americans to boycott the Olympic, the Olympic Games because they were held in Berlin and Adolf Hitler was trumpeting the superiority of the Aryan race. The Jewish position was a good position. Boycott these guys, boycott the Nazis who were persecuting Jews. Black leaders, many of whom were very sympathetic to the Jews, had their own problems. Discrimination against blacks in America was worse than discrimination against Jews and discrimination in Jews was significant. But the black experience was worse. And black leaders said, so many members of the American Olympic team are blacks. They will do well at the Olympic Games and they will enhance the image of black Americans. In one sense, they were right. Jesse Owens won four, black four gold medals at the Olympic Games. Hitler wouldn't sh shake his hand. And the press discounted him. You know what the Nazi, some of the Nazi press said? Of course, Jesse Owens won. He's not a human being, he's an animal. Can a human outrun a, a zebra? He's an animal. So that was a source of tension. And then the, the, but that was resolved. The black leadership was very sympathetic to Jews in the period of the 30s and during the Second World War, in the period of the Holocaust. But I'm now talking about the period after the war and in the 50s and the 60s, and then in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. In the final analysis, there will be, there will always be cooperation between Jews and blacks. There will always be. It may not be as strong and as pervasive as it once was, but there will always be. And the reason for that is whatever else divided blacks and Jews, we have a common interest in two issues. One, those who hate black people hate Jews. Those who hate Jews hate black people. The American Jewish community has experienced violence at the hands of white supremacists. Those white supremacists hate Jews and black people. 
an alliance against racism and anti-Semitism will always keep the blacks and Jews in a certain relationship. And then the other is something else. It is a rule of thumb in American economic history that black unemployment is twice the national average. Blacks need a strong advocacy from the American government, whether it's Republican or Democratic, to ensure a, a real strong, a strong economy. And Jews understand a declining economy as the night follows the day leads to an eruption of anti-Semitism as it did in the 1930s. Again, these are the things that link blacks and Jews together. From a strategic partnership or from a strategic point of view, the American Jewish community, again, which had relied ex really almost exclusively on the African American community, now finds itself in a position in which the relationship is still there with African Americans, but not as strong as it used to be. For American Jewish leaders now, the issue is to reach out to other minorities, to the Asian community, to the Latino community, to build a phalanx of support against racism and anti-Semitism. I am an optimist about this. I think these relationships will be created. They are already being created. And I am also optimistic about the black Jewish relationship. It's not going to be as it once was. It's not going to be. We've got to face that fact. But it is still there. And the Jews by themselves cannot alter history. Jewish success, whether it's on Israel, on Zionism, on anti-Semitism, is best strengthened by a Jewish ability to reach out to other minority groups. And I think, my friends, that that is what the future will be. I thank you very much for listening. And now I'm ready for your questions. Thank, thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to hold on here. No, I'm going to add. There we go. I want to just uh, put both of us on the spotlight so people could see both of us. Um, a, as usual, uh, a, a very informative uh, um, conversation and very provocative. Um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, one you kind of touched on already, um, but I'll come back to that. I think it's worth asking again. But the first question is really a, a bibliography question. Uh, what are the books that you would recommend on this topic? The two best books on the civil rights movement are David Garrow's biography of Martin Luther King Jr. and Taylor Branch's series of books. The one that deals with the period that I have spent most of the time talking about is Parting the Waters. There are a number of books that deal with black Jewish relations. They are also good. But the two best books on the civil rights movement, which also deal with Jewish involvement, are really those books. There are books with, about Southern rabbis in the civil rights movement, Jewish women in the civil rights movement. Again, all you have to do is just Google Jews in the civil rights movement and you'll get a pretty extensive bibliography. The second question, you, you, you did touch on this in terms of where there were tensions between the um, African-American and the Jewish communities. Um, but the question I, I think has to do more with some of the, the more extreme elements of that tension. Um, like if, if, if Jews were so involved with civil rights and so supportive of the African American experience, how is it possible that people like Louis Farrakhan and uh, Nation of Islam, um, just, you know, Je Jesse Jackson's anti-Semitism about Hamitown was offensive. He, he, he perhaps he didn't fully apologize for it, um, but that seems minor in comparison to, to what comes out of Farrakhan. Uh, and uh, what, how do we understand that? You're right on, you're right on the money, Rabbi. <laughs> I mean, compared to Farrakhan, <laughs> Jesse Jackson's a philo-Semite. I mean, <laughs> you're absolutely right on that. You're asking the most difficult question that a historian faces, the question of motivation. Does Farrakhan really believe it? Does he really believe this stuff? I mean, people should know what Farrakhan has said. Farrakhan holds Jews responsible for slavery, that they're the primary factors in slavery. 
both in bringing the slaves over to the new world and in oppressing, uh, creating uh, slavery in the United States. That is absolute nonsense. A group of American historians working on behalf of the American Historical Association have pointed that that's just sheer nonsense. He has also accused the Jewish community, Jewish doctors, of being responsible for the spread of AIDS and narcotics in the African American community. Again, absolute nonsense. His most recent discussion, which is really a very, it's probably the worst things that have been said about Jews since the end of the Second World War. He's, regard, he's referred to the Jews as termites who bore away at the African American community. And when he was asked, straightforwardly, are you an anti Semite? He said, I'm not an anti Semite, I'm anti termite. That's bad stuff. I mean, that's really bad stuff. Now, does he really believe it? I can't say that to you. But I think I've said this to you in, 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 the context, in another context. Now, I'm not being sarcastic here. There is an intellectual coherence and beauty in anti-Semitism. The intellectual coherence in anti-Semitism is the ability of anti-Semitism to explain multi-causal phenomena in a monocausal way. I'll say that again. The coherence is to be found in anti-Semitism's ability to explain multi-causal phenomena in a monocausal way. Why did Germany lose the war, World War I? Well, the Germans were defeated on the field of battle. That's why they, would, they lost World War I. There were other reasons as well. The lack of German finances, the, the strength of the British Empire, American soldiers coming over, French resilience, all of that's there. But for some Germans, it's the Dolchstoss, the stab in the back. That is, anti-Semitism explains confusing phenomena in one way, the Jews did it. The Juden sind unser Unglück. The Jews are our misfortune. It's a good way of mobilizing mass support. So, so let me ask a follow-up question, which is, um, you know, so we, we don't know what Farrakhan's motivation is um, for that. Um, how do we understand, um, well, let me say it differently. And, and, and maybe it's just my own impression. Um, uh, it's one thing for Farrakhan to be an anti-Semite. It's another thing for those others in the community to to ignore it, right? So it, it's like, you know, Farrakhan, even in the African-American community is somewhat on the margins. Um, but when he spews these things, it, it, you know, if people, if, if people, or if leadership in the, in the African-American community are condemning it, um, we're not hearing it. Um, and so do you have any understanding or insight about, uh, about you know, the quote unquote enablers? There, there has been condemnation from the African-American community. There has been, but you're right. It's not terribly vocal. And I, I don't think that there's a mystery here. The black community coalesces around black leaders. He's a black man, we are black and we don't want to be attacked from the flanks. We don't want to be charged of being an Uncle Tom. Yeah, Farrakhan may do some things. He may say some terrible things, but Farrakhan leads the Million Men March. Farrakhan talks about how black men have to strengthen the family. That, res that resonates well in the African-American community, but it's the loyalty to a black leader. He's black and we're black, and we don't ever want to be accused of undermining a black leader. This should not be alien to Jews in an earlier period of time. You lined up with Jacob Chavitz. You lined up with Emanuel Seller. You lined up with any, we lined up with Governor Lehman. Now it's different now as a consequence of assimilation to a certain extent in the United States. And as a consequence of the fact that uh, there are many non-Jewish politicians who are very sympathetic to the Jews, who are very strongly supportive of Israel. So if you have to vote between, if you have a choice between a Jew, uh, who may, he's Jewish, he may say this, the, the things that you want him to say, but a very strong white Gentile or black gent, a black Gentile who is supportive of Israel, you'll support, you may support the other man. But in an earlier period of time, Jews coalesced around a Jewish politician. It's a different time now, 
but we should understand why blacks do that. But you're absolutely right. It is very painful for us. One of the questions that we do not know, one of the things that we do not know is how strong is Farrakhan's influence in the African-American community? We don't know that. There have been acts of violence perpetrated against Jews in those neighborhoods in New York City where blacks and Jews live side by side. Crown Heights in Brooklyn, for example. That's in it. There's violence. And it's not Jews beating up blacks, it's blacks attacking Jews. What motivates this? Is it class tension? Although I must tell you, for the Frum community in Crown Heights, we are not talking about terribly wealthy people. Is it black-white tension, black, -white, black hostility towards white people? And in this case, the white people happen to be Jews. Is it religious antipathy? Is it the influence of Farrakhan? I don't know the answer to that. We know, know how popular Farrakhan is in the African-American community. We know that the Nation of Islam has tens upon tens of thousands of followers. We don't know about how influential he is, and we don't know if the people in the African-American community who are committing violence against the Jews, if they are motivated by Farrakhan. I can't answer that. But again, I say to you, Rabbi, you are right. Farrakhan is a problem for us. He is very smart and he is very articulate. Um, I, I'm glad uh, we're recording this, Stephen, because I finally have on record somebody telling me that I'm right. So, <laughs> I'm going to take this part of the recording and show it to my wife later. See? <laughs> um, uh, there, there are a couple questions that, that are coming up that um, um, uh, I want to like you know address a little bit and 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 of course Stephen if you have um, comments on it um, uh, feel free to chime in. The, the questions revolve around um, Black Lives Matter um, and and identity politics and certainly as um, as uh, uh, Tony wrote to me that the resurgence of identity politics um, can strengthen the insularity of various ethnic, racial, and religious groups. Um, uh, and that ascendance um, opens up the um, possibility as yet another catalyst for growing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. I think that that potential is there. How do we deal with it is um, by trying to build bridges. That Tony's question is, how do we deal with it? And by trying to build bridges and to continue to have active dialogue with leadership of, um, of, of the Christian community, of the Muslim community, and of the um, Black community, of the Black Lives Matter community in particular, in order to um, understand what their concerns are and have them hear and understand ours are. And I think that we can see, especially in Black Lives Matter, we can see some success as a result of that dialogue. Um, just a half step back, Black Lives Matter is a coalition of several different African-American um, groups. Um, and it, um, it coalesced into a movement and matured almost overnight um, this past summer um, with all the activity that we saw taking place, especially in the United States and even here in Canada and around the world. Um, and as part of that maturation, uh, if you go to the Black Lives Matter website today, um, you will see very clearly that the official platform of Black Lives Matter um, is not anti-Semitic and is not anti-Zionist um, and, and is actually um, a, a, an official platform um, by which we as Jews uh, can feel comfortable um, aligning ourselves and supporting the um, uh, Black Lives Matter um, without fear of, um, uh, of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't fringe groups that are part of the Black Lives Matter movement um, that are not anti-Zionist and or, or anti-Semitic. Um, they, they do exist, um, but Black Lives Matter as a matter of leadership and of platform is working very hard to push those voices to the margins of their movement. And, and in fact, you have to dig very deeply uh, within their website in order to find any um, any hint even of anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism. And so that is a direct result of the dialogue that has been taking place um, between the Jewish community 
and the um, uh, Black Lives Matter and African American um, community um, in the United States in particular, um, uh, at, at official levels of both um, the Federation, North American Federations, um, and of um, the Jewish um, uh, JCPO, JCPA um, within, um, within the US. Um, so that, that's, that's um, uh, an example of that. And then another example I just wanna give of, 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 um, uh, of progress is, is Al Sharpton, right? Al Sharpton was um, a, a tremendous voice uh, in Crown Heights um, uh, against Jews. Um, and, uh, and, and when the violence between the uh, Hasidic community, the Chabad community and the black community um, was at a boiling point, he was anything but helpful. Uh, but in the last um, five years in particular, um, he's done a deep dive of, um, uh, of understanding the impact of his words and his actions um, and has formally apologized to the Jewish community. Um, and I know the people that were directly involved with him, um, uh, uh, and um, and and I trust them personally um, as um, as being um, uh, trustworthy. That the process that they went through with him was a, a legitimate process of tshuva. And if you look at what he's written about in terms of the Jewish community um, and um, and his own um, his own growth in that, um, you know, um, you can see that progress. Um, you know, progress is possible. Whether or not people believe that, I'll leave that up to, to, to individuals um, and only time will tell in terms of the consistency of one's actions. Um, but, um, uh, but at least in those two um, areas, I, I have some personal involvement on the, on the global Jewish world um, uh, of those, uh, those, two, uh, um, uh, those two events. Uh, within the relationship of the Jewish community and uh, and the African American community and the Black community, um, and that gives me hope. As um, Stephen said at the end of um, his talk, um, there's there is reason uh, to be hopeful about the future. Um, uh, I see that um, somebody is raising their hand. Um, Abe's iPad. Um, I'm sorry, Abe. We're only accepting uh, questions via um, the chat um, this evening. Uh, so if you're able to chat that to either Betsedek directly or to me, Betsedek, or to me directly, uh, we'll take that. Um, while we're uh, waiting, um, any final thoughts or comments, Stephen? I'm hopeful. I said I was hopeful. <laughs> I must tell you, with great respect, <laughs> I agree with what you said earlier. It's got to be a cold day in July before you have, have me say a good word about Al Sharpton. Al, I'll say two words, a proper noun, Tawana Brawley. What Sharpton did in that case in upstate New York, accusing the district attorney and the police of really being insensitive to a black woman, a young black woman who claimed she was raped. And it turns out he stirred up the masses, brought about some violence, and in the end, the whole thing was a fabrication by the young black woman. He has blood on his hands in Crown Heights. And I'm, again, I'm not reading the same stuff that you are reading. I've never seen an apology from him. I've never seen an apology from him. Um, it's, it's in his book. Um, and um, there were, there were, he was interviewed about it a couple of years ago. Um, I think it was even in the New York Times. It was certainly in the Jewish Week. Um, and look, I, I, I'm not, I am the last person to defend him. Uh, I'm just, you know, what I'm saying is, is that um, I have heard, I've personally heard sitting at a, at a global leadership table of Jewish people, Al Sharpton um, apologize and express the fact that he's learned. At the end of the day, the proof's in the pudding um, and um, he is a person who um, seems to always seek the spotlight. Um, and in so doing so, it's always easy to be tripped up um, and to, you know, um, have the quote unquote Freudian slips, um, you know, where, where people in the heat of moments um, uh, defend, you know, say perhaps sometimes what they really think. All I'm saying is, is that 
there has been a process in the last five years um, where, where Al Sharpton has specifically in relationship to the Jewish community has been trying to make amends. Um, whether well, or not- I say in response to that, I, look, you have your experience and I, and who am I to deny or contradict that experience? Al Sharpton was invited by the Central, Con the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the, the, main, the main conference of reform rabbis. He spoke there. A good friend of, I, of mine who was a prominent reform rabbi said, he didn't do teshuva. He didn't lash out, said he was sorry about certain things, but it really wasn't a, an apology. If there ever was a time to make a, a real apology from the gut, that was the time to do it and he didn't do it. But I will yield to you, you have different experiences. But by and large, that's, that really is not the most relevant thing. The right, relevant exactly. thing is that, that you, we have to make bridges to the African-American community. I, I, now, all I'm saying, you know, Rick, Rick Jacobs, who's the head of the reform movement, takes a different view as what your friend does. I mean, so it's like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we know from Rambam that tshuva, real tshuva, is being placed in a similar circumstance and choosing a different course of action. And, and, and I, 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 I'm, I'm not a gambling person, but I'm willing to bet <laughs> that Al Sharpton will find himself in a similar circumstance again, and then we'll know. <laughs> right on. We will <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but um, but at least in terms of like, you know, when you look at what happens over the course of a period of time, it's like I, I know that there is an attempt at least for uh, that Al Sharpton is 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 trying to rehabilitate himself, whether or not that's sincere or so forth will lead up to other people. I know that that attempt is happening um, no. and it's happening and is happening in a serious way. No. OK. Um, Look, the, these are, you know, for those that are watching, the, the, this is exactly the, the, the difficulty with these kinds of things, right? You know, the, um, we're talking about I, I, identity. We're talking about feelings of, of persecution on, on both Jews and Blacks. We're talking about um, a shared history of doing positive things, hurt feelings about where, where those, when those bridges fell apart and, and fingers being pointed. Um, and, uh, and just like in our own personal lives and, uh, and in our own families, um, uh, when, when, when we are hurt deeply, um, um, it's just that much harder uh, to bridge the gap and to move forward. Uh, but we know um, both as individuals and as mm -hmm. um, members of a society uh, that the longer we carry that hurt, the more damage that, it can, be, that can be done which doesn't mean to forgive and forget, and it doesn't mean to, to forgive without reason to forgive, um, or to like, you know, be so forgiving that you let your guard down. Um, that's, that's dumb, um, but, it, but it does mean that if we're committed to these values, we have a lot of work to do, and that work's not gonna happen by talking about each other. It's only gonna happen when we talk with each other. Um, and um, we're fortunate that there are um, um, ongoing important dialogues, both here in Canada um, and um, in the United States and around the world, um, where, where Jews and Christians and Muslims um, and other faith groups, as well as um, Jews and Blacks um, are having um, that dialogue. Um, and God willing, um, as uh, Professor Burke said, um, we'll see more reason to be hopeful uh, into the future. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, Professor, thank you again, as thank always, you. for stimulating conversation. And um, as I said, God willing, next year in Toronto. <laughs> um, let's hope so. We, let's hope so. It's Thanks, everyone. Uh, if you're counting the Omer, tonight is the 11th Seventh day of the right. Omer. Correct. Right? Tonight is the 11th day of the, of the Omer. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night, Rabbi. Good night, all of you. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.